Welcome again in the Gospel of Luke. We're entering the last few chapters and we're actually in chapter 22 now. And these last chapters speak of the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus. The most important event in the whole of the history of mankind is the offering up of Jesus as a sacrifice for our sins. And uh, chapter 22 goes into it in great detail and it speaks of the fact that the Feast of Unleavened Bread draws nigh, which is called the Passover. And in the Passover, a lamb was offered. A lamb was offered for the sins of the nation the nation and that lamb of course represented the lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world in other words the Lord Jesus Christ and so we're looking at the events that are now preceding that offering of Christ that crucifixion of Christ and the important factor is this that the chronology of these events had to occur with mathematical precision because Christ had to die on that Passover. He could not die before. He could not die afterwards. Satan tried to kill him before, but uh, could not. But he had to die at the exact time. Well... In order to do this, certain events had to take place. And one of them was the fact that Satan entered into Judas. You know, he had to be betrayed. Christ had to be betrayed. And Judas was the one who was indeed there And Satan entered into him and he went his way and uh, he spoke with the chief priests and the captains that he might betray them unto them. And they were glad and covenanted to give him money. And we're told in other gospels it was 30 pieces of silver and that was the fulfillment of of the prophecy of Zechariah that uh, indeed give me how much you think I'm worth and it said 30 pieces of silver see all these things are prophesied in the Old Testament and fulfilled in the New Testament and only God can do things like that I mean these people were living hundreds of years after the prophetic word had gone forth about his crucifixion, about the fact that he would have nail marks in his hand, in his feet, in his side. There would be the spear that was thrust there. All these things were prophesied hundreds of years before they actually took place. And only God can declare a thing before it comes to pass. And so, the point that I want to bring out here is this, that uh, we're looking at extraordinary things, the fulfillment of Scripture, fulfillment of Scripture, and only God can bring that to pass. So many people were involved. Judas was involved. He was spoken of in Psalm 109 as one that would betray the Lord. And we have a revelation of his character. He hated blessing and loved cursing. John, the Apostle John, speaks of him as being a thief. He was a terrible man. Well... Here he is, Satan has entered into him, and um, what do we find? 
he goes to the captains and the chief priests and makes a covenant with them. They give him the money and he promises to betray Jesus. Then the day comes when the Passover must be killed. And now there's a very interesting, shall I say, event. You know, they had to have a Passover meal. And Jesus sent Peter and John to the city and said, Go, prepare us the Passover that we may eat. And uh, they said to Jesus, Well, where are we going? What room do you want us to prepare? And this is what he said. Uh, You'll go to the city and you will watch a man carrying water. Now that was an extraordinary thing because in those days, in fact in our days too in some countries, the women carry the water. But no, there was a sign. A man was carrying a water. And Jesus said, follow them. Follow him. And he will lead you to the place. And uh, that man will come to a house. And uh, you will say, you know, where is the guest chamber where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished. There make ready. And they went and found as he had said unto them, and they made ready the Passover. Now I want to pause a moment here. There are a lot of little events that took place. And I want to particularly speak on this good man of the household. Now, he must have been a very godly man. He must have been a man that prayed and had intimacy with the Lord to know that God's plan and purpose for him was to provide a guest chamber for the Lord of glory to eat with his apostles just before he died. And so you see in life, it may be that our contribution is not necessarily a great one, but nonetheless, there are little things that have to be fulfilled to enable the greater things to be accomplished. And that last Passover, that last supper, was an event of great importance because it was the institution of what we call the Holy Communion. But it had to have a guest chamber. And this good man, you see, obviously walked with the Lord. And he was like Simeon, you know, who had seen the Lord as a little baby. And God had promised him that he would not depart from this life before he had seen the Lord's glory in the uh, personification of that little baby, Jesus. You see... It may be that, no, the work that God has for you may not be of great importance in your eyes, but it is important for the sequence to be fulfilled of all that Jesus wants to do. And I want to encourage you, you know, walk with the Lord, hear from him, Fulfill those little things in life. And you know you too shall hear those words. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. You know, the Lord mentioned elsewhere. He said, anybody giving a cup of water to a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. There you are little thing but the reward is great I should imagine this man has a very nice house in heaven well we move on and uh, he came in and he sat down and uh, 
He then institutes what we call the Last Supper. And uh, he took the bread, gave thanks, said, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Likewise also the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. And so he instituted what we practice on Sunday mornings, the Holy Communion, in remembrance of him. And then he speaks of Judas. Now, the Lord always knew that Judas would be the one that betrayed him. He always knew that when he selected those twelve disciples, he had to select one who would betray him. And the interesting thing is this, that he treated Judas just like the others. Many of the parables were directed towards Judas, warning him about betrayal, warning him to stay on the path. But Judas didn't listen. And yet, you know, Jesus had such wonderful control over himself that the other disciples had no idea of the coming betrayal until this moment and they certainly did not know that it was Judas had they known of course I don't think Judas would have lasted long especially with Peter's adeptness with his sword but uh, no Jesus was able to control himself that they did not understand well now we move on they began to inquire among themselves which of them it was that should do this thing they had absolutely no idea that it was Judas and often I have found that when conviction comes in a service it is obviously the righteous that first ask Lord, what have I done? What have I got to put right? And that's the case here. Well, Judas knew, of course, who it was because he'd already uh, covenanted with the chief priests and captains for that 30 pieces of silver to betray him. But obviously he didn't say anything to the others. Now then there was a strife amongst them. And you know, if ever there was a time when Jesus needed strength, when Jesus needed help, it was now. But what happened? My, they were arguing amongst themselves as to who would be the greatest among them. And Jesus said, look, in the kingdom of heaven, things are different. It's the one who serves who is the greatest. And so he said, if you want to be great, then uh, be as the younger and uh, you sit and serve the others. And then he gave a special, what I might call um, reward, promise of reward to those 11 apostles. He said, because you have continued with me in my temptations, then I will appoint you a kingdom as my father has appointed me, and you will sit on the thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And so there was a special reward for the apostles. Now, he turns to Simon Peter. He's dealt with Judas. He's dealt with the other apostles desiring the greater place and told them that humility is the key to advancement in the kingdom. And now he looks at Peter. And he said, Peter... Satan hath desired to have you, 
that he might sift you as wheat. You know, Satan wanted to be able to test Peter. But he said, I have prayed that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, because the disciples were not born again until after the resurrection of Jesus, when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. Now then, verse 33 after all this lecture on humility, Peter was still extremely proud and he said, I'm ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. And really, that, that was the desire of his heart. He wanted to follow the Lord and he was willing to lay down his life for the Lord. But he was doing it in his own strength. And we cannot accomplish God's will in our own strength, whatever it is. You know, we must, you know, have a holy weakness that we can receive his strength in order to fulfill his will. And so Peter was going to try and lay down his life for Jesus at the wrong time. Because only Jesus could die as the Lamb of God. The other apostles could not be with him in that death. But later on, Peter was crucified and because he always remembered the denial of Jesus, he asked to be crucified upside down. But we move on here. And uh, Jesus said to Peter, Now I tell you, the cock shall not crow this day, before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. And he left it like that. Other Gospels bring out Peter's protestations and so forth. But you see, it's interesting how Luke recounts it. He said, I have prayed that your faith fail not. And that is a very important truth and it's something that pastors are, shall I say, constantly faced with that people fail the Lord and they give up. They want to give up, you see. And this is one of the things that uh, Jesus had prayed for, that he knew that Peter would indeed deny him. He knew that Peter would... uh, shall I say, not have the strength to fulfill his own desire by his own strength. And the result was that Jesus prayed that his faith fail not. That at that moment when he, and we shall see this later on, at that moment, you know, he will not give up. Well, we move on. And uh, we now come to Jesus praying on the Mount of Olives. And only uh, Luke, the medical doctor, recounts this. But uh, P- uh, Paul brings it out in Hebrews chapter 12. It was this, that uh, Jesus was praying a stone's throw from his disciples in the Mount of Olives. And he was praying you know, and resisting sin. And Paul brings this out. You have not yet resisted unto blood. And the blood of the vessels of his forehead broke and blood streamed down as all the forces of Satan were directed at his mind to give up. Now, what was the problem here? that Jesus was facing. Well, he says, you know, if you can take this cup from me, nevertheless, not my will, but thine. What was that cup? That cup was filled with all my sins, your sins, all the world's sins. And at that very moment in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we are told that in a very real sense, that... Jesus became sin. And that's what he was afraid of. He did not want to become sin. But he said, 
not my will, but thine be done. And that's how we should pray in many of the situations we find ourselves. Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. Well, he prayed more earnestly and the he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And uh, Paul makes the comment, none of us have uh, come to that place yet. When he rose up from prayer, he found them sleeping and he said, look, don't sleep at a time like this. Rise up and pray lest ye enter into temptation. And now something else is happening. Judas is coming with a large band of about a thousand people, we're told. A thousand people to take Jesus. And he comes up to Jesus. It's a prearranged sign that he's made with the uh, chief priests and captains. He said, whomsoever I kiss, that is the one that you're to take. And he came up to Jesus and kissed him. And... uh, Jesus said unto Judas, Betray us thou, the son of man, with a kiss. And you know, I've had those who have had extraordinary visions of hell. And they saw that Jesus took Judas into hell, you know, after he had died and put him in a special room and said to Satan, don't touch him. I will appoint his judgment at the great white throne. And uh, those who have had that vision see Judas in a corner of this room, you know, standing up and falling down again and saying, I betrayed him, I betrayed him. Such remorse, but repentance is not given. In fact, Jesus said of Judas, it would have been better that that man had never been born than to have accomplished that. Well, we move on. And uh, we find that they bound Jesus, brought him to the house of Ananas, and then Caiaphas. In fact, six trials Jesus had to go through. And learned jurists tell us that not one satisfied legal requirements according to Jewish law. Uh, number one, that they should not have taken him by night. That was forbidden. And I could go on here. But six trials and... Uh, In this remaining chapter, we find these trials. And the first one was the high priest's house. But the main point that Luke wants to bring out here is the testing of Peter. Peter sits down among them by the fire, and a certain maid beheld him as sat by the fire and earnestly looked upon him and said, this man was also with him. And he denied Jesus. And again, another saw him, thou art also of them. Again, Peter denied. And another came, of a truth, this fellow also was with him. For he said, Galilean, three times. And Peter said, man, I know not what thou sayest. Immediately, while he yet spake, the cock crew. And the Lord, who was just standing, just a little way from Peter, turned and looked at him. And then Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him, Behold the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. And Peter went out and wept bitterly. They wept bitterly. Yes, Peter received repentance. Judas did not. And Peter desired to do that which is right. Judas did not.
now he's brought before the third trial and uh, we find it in uh, verse 66 and uh, here it is they led him into their council at daybreak which was the Sanhedrin and they asked him here again they erred as jurists because under Jewish law one must not seek to cause the accused to how shall I say confess his crime force him to confess and yet that's what they were doing and they said art thou the son of God now he must be very careful how he answers here because he must tell the truth and so he said you say that I am and that was sufficient for them it was sufficient Jude you know Jesus gave a clear cut witness yes I am the son of God and they said what need have we of anything further let us take him to Pilate that he might be crucified well what will you do with Jesus will you deny him like Peter will you betray him like Judas or will you stand with him in hours of trial and say I am a Christian may God grant that will be your testimony Amen